This is Lesson 1, 2, Part A. We're going to talk today about Freud's levels of consciousness and his uh, structure of personality and how he believed that it was formed. The first thing that we need to be reminded of is that when we're talking about psychodynamic theories, we're talking about those internal unconscious forces as driving our behaviors. The unconscious mind is the reason that people from the psychodynamic perspective believe that we do the things we do. We learned that back in Psych 1. So now we're going to be looking at the psychodynamic theory much more in depth and we're going to have a much better understanding of the unconscious mind and a little bit about how Freud and others believe that it worked. The different levels of awareness according to Freud, and we are only going to be focusing on Freud for this lesson. Freud saw the mind like an iceberg. He believed that most of our mind is hidden. And as you look at this picture of an iceberg here on the screen, you see that the majority of the ice is below the surface of the water. And that's the way Freud saw the unconscious mind. I'm going to take you through each of the three levels of consciousness that Freud believed existed in the human mind. The first level is the conscious mind, the top of the iceberg the part of the iceberg that sits above the surface of the water, the part of the iceberg that we can see at any given point in time. So when we're talking about the conscious mind, we're talking about a person's awareness at a particular point in time. So anything that's going on in a person's mental state at that moment, the things that he hears, things that he sees, smells, the things he's thinking about at that moment, the things that are going on, anything internal or external, that would be considered a part of the conscious mind. The next level Freud called the pre-conscious mind and this, this is the level that's just below the surface of the water. He believed it was our temporary storage of thoughts. We can retrieve these thoughts very easily. If I were to ask you a question, for example, what's your mom's name? You probably weren't thinking about your mom's name before I asked that question, but once I asked it, you could easily call it out of your pre-conscious mind and bring it up to the top of the water into the conscious part of our mind. The third part of our mind is the largest part that Freud called the unconscious mind. This is the part that's completely submerged. We have no immediate access to our unconscious mind. It's submerged completely below our level of awareness. We are unaware of the things that are going on in our unconscious mind. We're unaware even of the things that are in our unconscious mind, but they greatly influence our behavior. They drive our behavior. They cause us to do things that we don't even know why we do them because they're in our unconscious mind, according to Freud. Freud actually called our unconscious mind quote, a reservoir of mostly unacceptable thoughts, wishes, feelings, and memories. Now why unacceptable? I'm not going to address that right this moment in this lesson. We'll talk more about that in a later lesson, but part of the reason that we don't accept Freud's ideas today is that he believed that the unconscious mind was filled with mostly inappropriate or unacceptable or things that were sexual and aggressive in nature and we believe now that the unconscious mind can be filled with more than just those unacceptable things that Freud believed. This is just another slide that shows another picture of what those three levels of consciousness look like and you can see some of the things I know it's kind of blurry but you can see some of the things that are believed according to Freud to be a part of each of those different levels of consciousness. We're going to move now into Freud's belief about how the personality is structured. Now what I want you to understand before we go any further is that the things I'm about to talk about, the things you're about to learn, are things that today's psychodynamic believers don't buy into anymore. We talk about these things, they are historical, they're foundational to understanding psychodynamic theory today, but the things I'm about to talk about, we don't believe this part of Freud's theory anymore. 
Okay, we have completely revised Freud's theory, but in order to understand the revisions, you have to know where it came from. So we're going to look at Freud, and we're going to look at his theory, which is called psychoanalytic theory. And then when it was revised, we called it psychodynamic theory. So the structure of personality, according to Freud, was made up of three components, and you can see them listed there in the bottom right corner, the id, the ego, and the superego. And if you've had some different classes, I know that Mr. Drosky talks about these in some of his classes, or whoever teaches Lord of the Flies now will talk about these three components of the personality, and they're conflicting components. There's a pleasure-seeking biological component, it's very impulsive, and it conflicts with another component, which is the social moral component of our personality that's unconscious also and it's internalized and those two just do not get along and then there's a mediator in between. So let's look at these three components of personality one by one. The first construct is called the id. Now it's not id, it's pronounced id. The id is an unconscious component of our personality. We call these constructs of personality. A construct is a hypothetical idea. These are not people. They're not little parts of our personality that have any sort of manifestation of themselves that's a physical manifestation. They're simply hypothetical ideas. So Freud actually called it an energy. The id is completely unconscious. Its goal is to satisfy our basic sexual and aggressive drives, and that's it. When you think of the id, it operates on the pleasure principle, which means that it demands immediate gratification, it avoids pain, and it is present mindset versus future mindset. Think about a baby who cries whenever he wants something. Give it to me now. Make this discomfort go away, and make it go away now. An infant doesn't know anything else. An infant cries when he needs something, and he wants that need met immediately. We are all born with our id. It's present at birth, and each individual has the same id. We all have the same sexual and aggressive drives that we're all born with as human beings. And this winds up being our dominant construct. And if you think about it, think about the things that you want. And we are a very immediate gratification kind of a society today. You know, we've got fast food. I want it. I want it now. It dominates us if we don't keep it in check. So the id is very childish. It's very selfish. And it's very controlling if we allow it to be. The second construct that develops, this we're not born with, but it develops, and it's called the ego. It's the largely conscious component of our personality, according to Freud. It's the mediator. Now at this point, when it's first developing, there's nothing to mediate between. It's just trying to keep the id in check. And it operates on the reality principle. The reality principle meaning that what's realistic? The id wants this, whatever it is, and it wants it right now. The ego says, you know what, right now probably isn't the best time for this. We're going to wait a little bit and get what it is that you want in a more realistic way. The ego is considered the decision-making component. And like I already mentioned, it's going to try to satisfy the id's desires in ways that will realistically bring pleasure rather than pain. Think about what the id wants. It wants pleasure. It wants it now but it's trying to avoid pain. The ego is going to try to help the id out and try to get what the id wants in a realistic way. So what it does is it delays that gratification of the urges that the id has until it's a more appropriate time. And as I already mentioned, the ego develops over time. It's not an innate construct that we're born with. The ego is developed through our experiences in the outside world. The third construct is the construct that the id is in conflict with. Once the superego, the third construct, begins to develop around age five, the superego is going to start providing standards for judgment. It's kind of like what we think of when we think of our conscience that's telling us the right thing to do. It is very judgmental. It operates on what Freud called the morality principle. 
It wants the person to do what is morally right, even if it hurts. It's going to say that whatever it is the id wants is the wrong thing to want. It causes us to feel guilty. It is a very irrational construct because there are things that we want and we can get those things, maybe not immediately, but the superego is going to say, no, it's wrong for you to even want that. And when you think back to what Freud said that the id's primary urges were, they were aggressive and sexual. So Freud is going to believe that the superego, anything that the id wants is going to be something bad. So you can see why these two constructs would be in conflict with each other. Again, I need to emphasize that these are things that Freud believed back during the Victorian era, 1900, Europe. Today's psychodynamic followers do not take all of these ideas that Freud had at face value. These are just foundational. The superego is learned from our environment, from the morals and values our parents are teaching us. The norms in, in society, the social norms, that we have regarding what's moral, what's right, what values we're going to hold, what things are good, eventually we internalize those things and they become the construct of the superego. The superego has two parts to it. It's both conscious and it's unconscious. And this is constantly developing. As we grow older, our superego becomes stronger. It has more values and more morals that it can adhere to. So it constantly develops as we are growing up. So here's another picture of Freud's iceberg. The analogy here, and you can see the different levels of consciousness, the conscious mind, the pre-conscious mind, and the unconscious mind. And now we've added in these three constructs of personality, the id, the one that we are born with, Pleasure principle, primary process thinking is what we call that. It's, it's very basic and primal, and it's completely unconscious. The ego, it does have an unconscious component, but it's mostly conscious. It's the decision-making component. It uses secondary process thinking. It's focused in reality. It knows what's going on. It knows how to meet our needs in a realistic way. And then the third construct to develop is called the superego, and you can see that off to, to the left. It's operated by the uh, morality principle, and it is both conscious and unconscious as well. Here's an example of how these three constructs work together. And you saw these on the right-hand side of the slides as I was going through each of the constructs. The first component, the id, says, I want chocolate. I'm hungry. I'm, I want some chocolate. This is what I want, and I want it now. The superego is going to be the construct that's going to be in severe conflict with the id, and the superego is going to be acting on the morality principle. It's going to cause guilt. You don't need chocolate. You shouldn't want chocolate. You're on a diet. No chocolate for you. Ego steps in and says, okay, guys, we got to get along, and here's what we're going to do. Superego, we hear you. We're on a diet. We don't need all the chocolate, but you know what? The id wants it, and the id's going to fight till he can get it. So we're going to eat a small bar of chocolate. That's just a, a you know little example of how those three constructs work together. But understand the ego is the decision-making component of the, and mediates between those two constructs. Another picture here that we often see when we think about the id, ego, and superego, the id is like the little devil on our shoulder saying this is what I want and it's always bad and it's always something we shouldn't have, that sort of a thing, and it's selfish. And the superego is like the angel on the side saying, no, be perfect, this is the way we do things. And the ego's in the middle trying to mediate between the two and trying to make a good decision. So that takes us through the first of our three lessons on Freud. We've discussed the levels of consciousness, and we've discussed the three constructs of personality. So make sure you write down any questions that you might have. As we come back to class, I'll be sure to give more examples on some of these things. But uh, ask any specific questions that you've got um, for the time being so that we can address those when you come back to class.